Now, this is a real key dynamic. When a person is called a patient, um, when, you, when, when I was introduced just a little while ago, I was not introduced, this, I was, you didn't hear me being referred to as a dental patient. This is Dr. Sabati's a dental patient. <laughs> I am a dental patient in relation to my dentist. But that is not my principal identity socially. But an Alzheimer's patient, now that's the person's I was, principal identity. I was, I was uh, giving a talk to a, a caregiver education group at Holy Cross Hospital one night, and uh, afterward a couple approaches me, and, and the woman introduces me, herself to me initially and says who she is, and, and, and she, she's a speech pathologist, and she said, and this is my husband, he's the patient. Now, it turns out that her husband, the patient, had commented to her during my talk, that guy really knows what he's talking about, which was one of the best compliments I've ever received. Yet, this is my husband, he's the patient. This is my husband, he's the person who's been diagnosed. Is different from this is my husband, the patient. Well, you might as well say, this is my husband, the philanderer, or this is my husband, the skin flint. This is my husband, you know, I mean, why bring that up? In any event, Let's look at the difference between patients and persons for a few moments. So I have, this is not a, 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 a finite list, but, but to think about it. Patients are recipients of care. They, they're managed, treated, and told what to do. And that's the language that physicians use. We're managing the patient. They're subservient. Patients are in a junior position to everyone else. You just can't do anything you want in a hospital because they tell you what to do. That's why you all tell... How many of you here have, have thought, oh, if I told your loved ones, if I ever go into a hospital, I need to have an advocate? Right? You need to have an advocate because you can't do things for yourself because you're in a junior position to everyone else. You're subservient. You need somebody from the outside. You're lacking in independence and agency. Alzheimer's patients are often not viewed as being what's called semiotic subjects. Let me give you an example of a what a semiotic subject means. The, the general idea, and the one you have to keep in mind, is this is a person whose actions reflect meaning. They're driven by meaning. They're driven by the meaning of a situation to that person. But people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's are often not viewed as being able to make meaning of situations and as being driven by the meaning of situations. So, for example, um, Mrs. K is at the day center. This is not the person who had the PhD in sociology, but Mrs. K was another person, and she had terrible word-finding problems, and she hardly ever spoke. The only times I ever heard her speak were when we were looking through a magazine, oops, sorry, a magazine once, and um, she, in, in, during the Vietnam War, she had been a, a, an ardent uh, opponent of the war, and um, very, very active that way. And so in this magazine, there was a picture of Richard Nixon, and she saw the picture and said, I hate that man. Oh, I just hate that man. <laughs> Otherwise, I hardly ever heard her speak. <laughs> but she could help set tables. She always was on the lookout for somebody who needed help in a wheelchair getting through a door. She would hold the door. She would always spot this like that. Whenever they would have a small group discussion, she would absent herself, and she would walk up and down in the hall. Where are you going, Mrs. K? Where are you going? She was avoiding a situation that was potentially embarrassing to her. She was, and just because I don't understand why she's walking in the hall doesn't mean she doesn't have a reason, which is a really fantastic idea, right? Aimless wandering. I don't understand why you're doing that, therefore you can't have, possibly have a reason. What a wild thing to come up with. Um, persons, on the other hand, are not just recipients of care, but they also give care. They're not subservient, but can be on an equal social plane or above others, depending on the situation. Persons are interacted with rather than managed, unless you're working in a factory and somebody is managing you. They exercise independence and agency and are viewed as meaning-driven people. Now, the, the real incredible difference between persons and patients I, I thought was really illustrated well by Christopher Reeve's 
reactions to situations. This is after he was injured in that equ in equestrian accident and realized that he was quadriplegic. He apparently asked his wife to help him commit suicide. And she, in talking with him about that, prevailed on him to give it some time. How about if we wait a little time and see how things go? And if after some time goes by, you still want to do this, I will help you. Now, most of us know that Christopher Reeve became an indefatigable uh, worker in, in the whole area of raising consciousness about spinal cord injuries. He was on Capitol Hill. He was testifying. He created a foundation. He, he was incredibly active in doing things that were good and meaningful to help people like him, even though he might not live to see what would happen in the end. Someone asked him, how do you explain that you wanted to end your life and you wind up doing all this stuff. How do you explain that? And he said, well, the first thing that had to happen was I had to stop being a patient and, stop be and start being a person. So he was saying that when he was thinking of himself as being a patient, it was inimical to the whole idea of doing anything, of being active, of being involved in the world, that he was putting himself in a, in a box that, that prevented him from acting. But when he started being a person again, he could do, he could be. And what I'm suggesting to you is that he was verbalizing something that could be going on inside the minds of any number of people who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. They've treated as patients. Think about it. A, a former student of mine was, was at a nursing home in the Virginia area not, about a couple of months ago, visiting her grandmother. Bless you. Visiting her grandmother, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And now this former student of mine lives in New York City and works there. And she has family members who live in this area. So she goes to visit her grandmother, and she's noticing that when ever there's food being served, somebody is feeding her 85-year-old grandmother. And they bring a tray to the room and they're feeding her. And at one point, she said to the aide, look, stop this, I'll take care of it. And she put the fork in her grandmother's hand, dipped it into the food, brought it to her, and her grandmother just started feeding herself. And she said, it really took a long time for my grandmother to eat as much as she wanted, a lot longer than it would have taken had the aide done it. But her grandmother was being a person again, feeding herself again. She was, and, and there were times when she would, my grandmother wanted something to drink, and she, she put the glass and her grandmother just sat there and opened her mouth. She said, no, Grandma, take it in your hand. And, and she did. Can you imagine? being put in that patient mode and having things done for you and slowly, slowly, slowly you stop doing for yourself. And then what are you and who are you and compared to who you've been who compared with who you've been? You follow the point. There's a difference between being a patient and a person. And when we treat people in a certain way, they'll act that way. And so it's, the, part of the problem here is the language we use. They're patients, they're not persons. There's a difference between a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and an Alzheimer's patient. And we have to be able to articulate this in our language. And, and, and with all of that comes the stigma, because a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's, well, that's just being diagnosed as one of my attributes. I have a bunch of others. But when I'm an Alzheimer's patient, that's who I am. And that's what I become. We have too many psychological studies with children and adults showing that people do what's expected of them. And when we expect very little, we get very little. And what has to happen is that we have to be able to articulate this to the people who hold, have the purse strings in Congress so that, so that money goes to people who, who can be trained to do this kind of work with people diagnosed in day centers, in nursing homes. It's, it's not all about medicine. For example, General Yu. Now, this is a guy I, I knew 10 years ago. He didn't have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, but he did have a diagnosis of dementia. 
General Yu, on June 6, 1944, hit Omaha Beach as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. After the war, he stayed in the Army for 36 years. By the time he retired, he was a brigadier general. He had been in Korea and in Vietnam, and there was some suspicion that the dementia was caused by Agent Orange. But that wasn't necessarily ever verified. In any event, I got to know him in, in 2005 and 6 and 7. At, at a certain point, he went into nursing home, and it was a very, very high-end nursing home. And um, one day, Apparently, one of the aides came in early in the morning, woke him up, and told him it was time to take a shower. He said, no, I don't want to take a shower now. He's just waking up. The aide said, no, it's time to take a shower. And he said, no, I don't want to take a shower. And the aide started to pull him out of his bed, and he fought back and hit the aide. The aide then reported that he was being uncooperative and combative. And before you know it, he's being given Seroquel, which is expressly contraindicated by the manufacturer in terms of giving it to people diagnosed with dementia. The point is that here this man is reacting in a way that's perfectly reasonable, but because he has the diagnosis and because he's a patient, his actions are viewed in the narrative of symptom of disease rather than symptom of being a normal human being. Look, all of you take showers, right? I mean, we're baths. You, you do your personal hygiene. I've been doing this for years. No one has ever tried to pull me out of bed and put me into a shower, especially someone I don't really know. And if someone did, I'd say, get the hell out of here. And I'd be right. Now, why would we expect a person to act any differently simply because the person has a diagnosis. And the problem, of course, is that I understand the aide has a job to do. There's a, a list, checklist of things that that person has to do, the job, to, I get it. I get it. But that has to change. And that has to change, and the only way it's going to change is if all of these places are given funding to train people the way they need to be trained, to think about people the way they need to think about people.